I'm going to ask if you will to pray with me as we open God's word tonight. Father, thank you again for the privilege of being in this place. Thank you for this precious book, God's word. Thank you that it never changes. Lord, help us to never change. Help us to stay with the truth of your word in these days. Lord, when time comes for us to lay this old flesh down, I pray, Lord, that our testimony of being consistent with the truth of your word would stand. Bless our time together. Make me a blessing to the hearts of your people here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen. We're looking into Psalms 145 for our text tonight. I began there last Wednesday night looking at the first 10 verses. We're going to look down at verses 11 through 21. If you've got your Bible open, we'll look there. I'll read the verses and then make a couple of comments and we'll look at some final thoughts out of these verses tonight. Verse 11 of this chapter says, They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will be destroyed. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and forever. As we begin our look at this 145th Psalm, this is actually the last section in the book of Psalms. And it is somewhat different. Uh, we find praise taking place all the way through the Psalms, but... It is intermingled with um, the words of the psalmist as he, uh, as he is asking God for deliverance from his enemy, as he's expressing his burden and his needs. But beginning with this 145th psalm, we have got pure praise for the next six chapters. Everything in these last chapters of the book of Psalm has to do with the name of God. My good friend, Brother Bud Martin, who pastors down at Bethel Memorial Baptist Church in Lafette, helped me greatly with my introduction to this final part of the psalm. In fact, if I had heard his message uh, that he preached last uh, Wednesday, or last Thursday at the Preacher's Fellowship, I would have used this then because it was better than my introduction to the entirety of this psalm. In fact, this would be a, a great thought, I think, to use for a series of messages dealing with these remaining chapters of the book of Psalms that I just told you deal entirely with the matter of praising God. Brother Martin made this statement in his message. Now think about this. Think about what I'm about to say. Listen to what I'm about to say. He made this statement in his message as he began our fellowship last Thursday. Our God cannot be exaggerated. Now let that sink in. Our God cannot be exaggerated. The word exaggerate means to think or speak or write of as greater than really is. To magnify something beyond the fact. To overstate, to increase or enlarge to an extreme or an abnormal degree. To overemphasize to intensify. Our God cannot be exaggerated. Sometimes we'll use hyperbolic terms to uh, attempt to add meaning or to give meaning to what we're talking about. For instance, 
You've made the statement. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Hmm? Could you eat a horse? No. You're exaggerating. You've made the statement, I'm so tired I could sleep a week. Well, you couldn't do it. You would never be able to do that. Or, or you probably have heard someone make this statement. He or she is fat as a... I'm not even going to say the last word. But you know they're really not. He's as dumb as a box of... But they really are not dumb as rocks. Nor are they fat as a pig or as fat as a cow. <laughs> we exaggerate. But you can't exaggerate God. Think about that for a minute. Now just let that sink in. You cannot exaggerate God. When it comes to our Heavenly Father, that there is just absolutely no way for us to exaggerate Him. Genesis 14 and verse 22 says, He is the Most High God. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 8 says he is higher than the highest. We talk about his omnipotence. That word means all powerful. You can't exaggerate that. God is as powerful as what? Well, there's nothing in this world as powerful as God. We talk about his omniscience. That means all knowing. That, that means he knows everything. That, nothing has ever occurred to God because he's always known everything. You, can, you can't exaggerate the knowledge of God. We talk about His omnipresence. That means everywhere, all the time. You cannot exaggerate that. There's no way. There's no way you can exaggerate someone being all-present more than being all-present. I mean, if you're present everywhere all the time, how do you exaggerate that? We talk about His immutability, which means He is unchanging. He never changes. You, you cannot exaggerate that. Well, here in our study of Psalms 145, David is giving us five reasons why he is determined to praise God. I have included a, a descriptive word in front of each of those virtues that give us a little more understanding of what David is talking about. We looked at the first two of those last Wednesday evening. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. I will, I will just review those and touch on them and move on. If you want to go back and look at those, if you haven't, then I would encourage you to do that and go back and look at those two points and add them to the three that we'll look at tonight. In verses uh, 1 through 6, David says he's praising God for his unsearchable greatness. Greatness that is beyond comprehension. That's literally what he's saying. You, 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 you cannot define the greatness of God. And in these verses, he magnifies the fact that God is great in the first four verses. And then in verses five and six, he magnifies the fact that God is glorious. Then in uh, verses seven through 10, he tells us that he's praising God for his unrestricted goodness. That word unrestricted means uh, there are no exclusions to his goodness. God doesn't exclude anybody from his goodness. <laughs> Everybody is a candidate for the goodness of God. And there's no limit. God doesn't limit his goodness to white middle class Americans. Let me, let me tell you tonight. God loves those people coming across the border just as much as he loves you sitting on the pew in this building tonight. Now I realize, you know, we can talk about the illegality and all, all that of people coming into this country like, like all that's going on and certainly that's true. But I want to tell you that doesn't limit the love of God. I, let me go a step further and tell you tonight, God loves every Muslim in this world as much as he loves you. That may leave a bitter taste in your mouth, but I'm telling you tonight, friend, his son went to Calvary and died for the sins of the whole world. God's, God's goodness is unrestricted. David in verses 7 and 8 talks about the graciousness of God. And then in verses 9 and 10, he talks about the goodness of God. And it's unbounded. It, 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 it's unrestricted. That brings us to where I want us to be tonight. And looking at these last uh, 11 verses, beginning in verse number 11 down through verse 21 tonight. And look at these uh, last three reasons that David gives us here 
as to why he's praising God. In verses 11, 12, and 13, he tells us that he's praising God for his unspeakable glory. Now, that, that's glory that cannot be described in human language. That, that is glory that is beyond human expression. If you were going to express the glory of God, how would you do it? There are no words to do that. You can't express God's glory. If you look at these verses, David calls attention to two important facts concerning the glory of God. In verses 11 and 12, he talks about the power of his glory. He says, they shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. The power of his glory. As I, as I read those two verses and, and thought about them, I, I thought about the story of Queen Sheba back in 1 Kings chapter 10 who came to visit Solomon. And uh, Solomon was a bit foolish because Solomon had a problem with women anyway. And Solomon was a bit foolish with the queen of Sheba because he took her and showed her all the, all the wealth of his kingdom, all the prosperity of his, of his kingdom, all the military might of his kingdom. And she made a statement in 1 Kings chapter 10. She said, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. She's talking about Solomon's kingdom. Well, that was true of Solomon in his day. Let me ask you tonight, where is the kingdom of Solomon tonight? Where is that kingdom tonight? Where is, where is the prosperity and the power and the glory of Solomon's kingdom tonight? I'll tell you where it is. It's where all the prosperity and power and glory of the kingdoms of this world usually wind up. Time has eroded away all except the record of their power and glory. When we speak of the power and the glory of God, we're speaking of that that fills time and eternity. All of time is filled with the glory of God. All of eternity is filled with the glory of God. In fact, all power comes from God. Apart from him, even the laws of nature would be inoperative. None of them would operate. Man thought himself brilliant when he discovered nitroglycerin and he discovered dynamite, that he could make dynamite out of nitroglycerin. I remember reading about those who, who discovered that explosive power. They thought for sure that would end warfare in our world, but it did not. All it did was increase the destruction that comes about in war. But I want to tell you who put the power in that nitroglycerin. God did. Man really patted himself on the back when he took credit for releasing the power of the atom. But I want to tell you, God, God knew that power was there all along. Why? Because he put it there. God put it there. But I can tell you tonight, all that power, as great as it is, cannot compare with the power of God released through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in this world. None of it can equal that power tonight. Power that will change and transform vile, wretched sinners into sons of God, making them the sons of God. Notice that the psalmist emphasizes in these verses, the necessity of speaking or making known to the sons of men. Verse 12, he says to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts. One of the problems of this generation of young people today is my generation and the generation following them has failed terribly to express to our children and our grandchildren the glory of God. It's our responsibility my responsibility, your responsibility, it falls on our shoulders as God's people. I can tell you tonight, the world's not going to fulfill that obligation. We're going to have, if it's going to be done, we've got to do it. 
And by the way, that responsibility has to be fulfilled by each succeeding generation. That's the reason you need to study your Bible. That's the reason you need to look for the work of God. You need to pray for the work of God. And as you do, express, express that to others and, and, and share that with others. Not only do I see the power of His glory here, but I also see the permanence of His glory. Look at verse 13. And thy, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. It is a fact tonight that the kingdom of our God is without beginning, it is without break, it is without bound, it is without end. It is eternal tonight. The kingdoms of this world come and go. The rulers of this world come and go. But I want to tell you, God reigneth eternally. Now you and I know tonight that his kingdom exists in the hearts of those who have trusted him as their Lord and Savior and are living for him today. But I want to tell you there is a wonderful, glorious day just ahead when the Lord Jesus is going to return to this world and establish his kingdom on earth again. And it's going to be just like it was uh, in the Garden of Eden when he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And it'll be a wonderful time. Through the years, there have been men who wrongly thought that they were going to visibly usher in God's kingdom. I've seen some preachers get off in this tangent. And just think, we're, we're going to be able to usher the kingdom of God in. We're going to win enough people to the Lord that we're going to make, we're going to make heaven on earth. But I want you to know tonight, beloved, that's not going to happen until Jesus Christ returns to occupy his throne. So in these verses, David is praising God for his unspeakable glory. Then, then notice fourthly, in verses 14 through 16, he's praising God for his unselfish giving. And he pictures that unselfish giving in two ways. By, by the way, that, that word unselfish means putting the interest of others above our own interest. And God put my interest and your interest above his interest when he sent his son into this world to die for our sins. David mentions a couple of things here in verse 14. He mentions God's pardon. Look at it. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Uh, remember, as we started looking at this psalm, it says David's psalm of praise. And I can assure you, if you study the life of David, you, you, you'll find out that nobody knew the truth of this verse better than David did. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raise up, raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Very few people have fallen as badly as David fell in his life. Yet from the pit that he fell into, God picked him up. God sought him. What would you, what would you, what would you have done in that situation? How would you have reacted toward David? David. What out there and committing adultery with Bathsheba and then having her husband murdered? What would you have done in reaction to that? You say, he ain't worth fooling with. He's not worth even having. Listen, he's not even worth thinking about. But I'm going to tell you, God sought him out. God sent Nathan, the man of God, down to put his finger in his face to say, thou art the man. And so God lifted him up out of that pit. Yes, Seemingly, it's always the tendency of man to push those down who have fallen. But the Lord delights in reversing things. He puts down the lofty and he lifts up the fallen. When I read this verse, I, I, I thought about that woman in Luke chapter 13 who had suffered from an infirmity for 18 years, the Bible tells us. And that infirmity, if you read those verses, you'll find that that infirmity had left her literally, the Bible says, bowed together. She, she, was, she was like a knife that you had folded up. She was bowed together. She could not lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and he said, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. And the Bible says he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Whatever the Lord Jesus touches, he makes straight. If you're saved this evening, that's exactly what the Lord did for you. He raised up all that be bowed down. 
Not only does he mention God's pardon here, but he mentions God's provision. Look at verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Are you part of that crowd tonight? Boy, I am. I, I, I'm waiting upon the Lord tonight. I, listen, I get, I get frustrated and discouraged, and, and, and then I have to remind myself that God's still on the throne. And I just need to, I need to focus my eyes back on Him and wait on Him. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat. When? In due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. Not only does the Lord save, but he also satisfies. What we need, God has promised to supply. The, the, the phrase there in the beginning of verse 15, the eyes of all wait upon thee. That, that phrase signifies four things. Number one, it signifies dependence on him. Number two, expectancy from him. Number three, confidence in him. And number four, adoration of him. All those things are bound up. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Notice in verse 15 that the Lord is always on time. He says, in due season. Not, not my time frame, but his frame. He never arrives too early, nor does he arrive too late. Notice also that his giving never taxes his resources. All he has to do is Open his hand. Thou openest thine hand, verse 16. Just opens his hand. <laughs> That's all he has to do. Open his hand. You've got a need? All he has to do is, is open his hand. And the needs of all of his creatures are supplied. Notice lastly in verses 17 through 21. David said, I'm praising God for his unmeasured grace. You can't measure the grace of God. Unmeasured grace. <laughs> look at it as long as you want to look at it. You'll never, you'll never be able to calculate the width, the depth, the length of the grace of God. Verses 17 and 18, he talks about the person of this grace. Look at it. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Boy, that's a, that's a verse you ought to mark in your Bible because that, that's our Lord. He, everything he does, he is righteous in. Everything he does, he is holy in. He's righteous and holy in everything he does. God is not, not, God's not going to break his righteousness, his holiness to do anything. Not for me, not for you, not for anybody. So he talks first of all about the person of his grace. When he saves us, our, our salvation comes not at the expense of his holiness, but rather magnifies his righteousness in the death of his son. He said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. And God did not set that aside in order to save me or to save you. What he did is execute that penalty on his son in my place and in your place. In verse 18, he reminds us of how close this grace is to each of us. Look at it. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. For a number of years, I, I have uh, carried a AAA service uh, card in my billfold in case I had a flat tire or my car wouldn't crank or I did the unthinkable and went somewhere and locked my keys up in the car or something of that nature. And there have been several times over the years that, that I've had to uh, I've had, had to call them to come. And they always came. But the problem was I had to wait on them. Most of the time, you're going to wait 45 minutes to an hour for them to get there. Now, that, you know, that's not, that's not bad unless you stand outside in the cold wind. You can't get out of it, that, that sort of thing. But, but you had to wait. But notice what this verse says. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. What a blessing to know that my Heavenly Father is always on call, that all I have to do is call on his name. And there's only one restriction on all that. He says, that call upon him in truth. God is never going to trample his word 
in order to meet a need or to answer a prayer that I may utter. He's not going to do it. He is bound by his word. So he says, who pray in truth. What does that mean? That means we've got to have a true heart. And, and the truth has to be in our heart. We've got, to, we've got to pray according to the Word of God. We don't need to pray contrary to the Word of God. We need to pray according to the Word of God. And a God of truth cannot be near to a spirit of hypocrisy. You're going to recognize what I say. And, and I, I'm not talking about anybody in particular tonight. But I've been doing this long enough in church... To have heard these folks called on to lead in prayer and they would almost choke on the words they were trying to bring. Almighty God. Trying to impress somebody with their vernacular. Let, let me tell you that God is not impressed with your education or your vernacular at all. What moves the heart of God is what right here in your heart. A heart of truth. Notice secondly here he talks about the provision of his grace. Look at verse 19 and 20. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. The words fear him speak of reverencing his name and his law. What more could you and I want than what he promises to provide for us? He's provided, he, hey, listen, but Terry, he's promised to supply every need you've got. What, what do you, what else could you hope for than, than the needs in your life? What else could you hope for? <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was listening to something this week. Uh, you know, I, I, the news has been full of this thing about uh, Tom Brady. Superman Tom Brady is retiring from football. And they, they were, they were, uh, you know, I'm glad Tom Brady can retire from football. I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I got a thing in the world against Tom Brady. But, but they were talking about, he went down to the lower end of Florida. And he bought a mansion for $17 million. And he sent a destruction crew in there. And they're tearing the whole thing down. Because it's not good enough for him. Tom Brady can have his whatever million dollar mansion he's going to build down there. But he's not going to get to live in it long. He's, he's bumping 50 years old. He's got 20 more years maybe. 30 at the most. He's not going to get to live in it long. But I will tell you what, I've got a mansion I'm going to live in for all eternity that the Lord has provided for me. The last phrase of verse 20 is, is a warning that God's grace is not to be trifled with. All the wicked will he destroy. He's promised to provide his grace for us, for all those that love him. He secures us. He satisfies us. He saves us. And then verse 21 ends where we began. Look at it. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and forever. David is recording for us his commitment to praise here. He's, com he's telling us that he's going to use his mouth to praise the Lord. And then he issues a challenge for all flesh to bless his holy name forever and ever. John Newton wrote that beautiful hymn that we sing that, it, by the way, is the number one hymn in all of Christianity, Amazing Grace. Well, the question is, what other word could you use for, for God's grace and amazing? I mean, and, 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 and that in no way at all even expresses the, the wonder of His grace. Surely if all of God's creation are redeeming Him, then you and I as a redeemed ought to lead the way in that, in that praising the Lord. Don't you think so? Surely, surely those of us who are saved, we ought to be at the top of the list of those who are praising the Lord. I read this story about uh, a little five-year-old girl and, and her, her mom and dad had put her into church kindergarten. Uh, I believe where they attended church, they had a church kindergarten. And uh, every day before the children were dismissed in the evening, the teacher had them sing the doxology. You know what the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. 
And that little girl just loved that song. She loved the song. By the way, kids love good hymns and good music. Kids love those songs. Uh, you know, and, and uh, she loved that song. In fact, she loved it so much that, that she, she set her up her own, her own words for the last part of it. And every day as they would sing, she would sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures, here we go. <laughs> well, that's the way we ought to be. You know, that's the way you and I ought to be. We ought to be praising the Lord everywhere we go. We ought to praise Him in front of our children. We ought to praise Him in front of our neighbors. We ought to praise Him in front of our family. We ought to praise Him in front of strangers. Whenever God gives us breath and wherever He gives us breath, we ought to praise the Lord for who He is tonight. You cannot exaggerate God. Write that down. You cannot exaggerate God. Help us with our life and with our lips to glorify Him in these days. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your head with me tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed for just a moment. I, I don't know spiritually where you are tonight. I, I don't know what's going on with you and where you are. Maybe you need to talk to the Lord about a burden, a need in your life tonight. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Thank the Lord for church on Wednesday night. I'm glad I can pray at home, and, and I do. But I want to thank the Lord for being able to come to church and pray with God's people. And uh, be in a service like this and come down to the end and, and be able to pray. Maybe you just need to talk to the Lord about something in your life tonight. Then it may be that you've got a spiritual need tonight. Uh, don't, don't, don't waste the time God's given you with getting that, that whole thing straightened out. Bring it to the Lord. And let, let, it, let, him, let him help you out of his word to get that straight in your life. I'd encourage you to do that tonight. Father, thank you for the truth of your word tonight and the blessing of being here. Bless the truth of your word to our hearts. And help us as that little girl. To praise God, here we go. Everywhere we go. To everybody we see. To lift up your matchless, matchless name. I'm going to ask you to stand with me quietly for a moment as Miss Janet plays. And as need has been made evident in your life, why don't you just talk to him about it tonight? Wherever that need's at, talk to the Lord about it.